I need help. So I have you set to share the screen. Okay, share the screen. Why do you want to share the screen? She wants me to share the screen. You want to share my screen? Yes, so that all we see is you. What? Uh, sorry. Marcy, is it speakers view? It's at the bottom. Marcy, is it I put it on speakers. Share. I put it on speakers. I put it on. Okay, my share my screen. Not... You see my desktop. You're not going to see me. Okay, but we need to see the screen that you were on. Look at my face. So down on the lower right, there should be the screen for, oh, you have a Apple, for the Zoom. So this one, you can't see me. It looks like a camera towards the right. Camera towards the right. I think he has to get out of share screen. He has to get out he of share be. screen. It should be speaker's view. It should be. Okay, I put it as speaker's view, but we each have to okay. do that then. I put it as speaker's view, but we each have to do that then. This, says, this is not our problem. She has to fix it. You're sharing. Okay, it. he's already. So you have to share it or something, worldly said. Here, I am seeing Michael Big on the screen. You're I seeing him on the screen? I see yes, him too. I, I see him too. I went to singing? speaker's view. As long as Michael is speaking and no one else talks, Michael will be on the screen. Okay. Looks uh, good. Okay, so if anybody has a question, maybe they could just raise their hand in between any time and then we could stop for a second and you could ask if you have a question about anything. Michael, ask everyone to go on mute. <laughs> oh, everyone should be on mute. And then if they want to talk, then they'll unmute. Just for the time that they're asking. How's that? I've muted. I've muted everyone. Okay, perfect, Marcy. Thank you. Um, so, oh, now we're Shirley. Go? Shirley, you got to take. Shirley, you chose screen share. Now we're only seeing you. Please take your screen share off, Shirley. Shirley Gordon. Thank you. Go ahead, we Michael. Good? We're all go good. ahead, Michael. Okay, so my wife Monica's sitting here. She's actually the one that makes most of the breads, um, but I'm gonna I'm the one that you know does the talking and the te teaching. So uh, today we're gonna make challah. Challah challah bread is obviously all the Jewish folks know it as challah, but it has many other names in Eastern Europe where it really originated from. Uh, Pasca in Polish. Uh, what's another one? Kalach in Hungarian. Uh, so there's a, a, a brioche, which is a French bread, is basically the same dough. So it's a dough that you're making, unlike plain bre white bread, where you're enriching it with eggs and butter or margarine. If you're going to be doing it in a kosher setting, you have to use only margarine generally because normally you're serving it with a meat meal. So you'd have to, you know, omit the butter. So unless you were doing it for breakfast, then you could serve it with a, a butter base, but you need some fat. So what I've done is I've gotten it a little bit ahead of time. I, can you see in that bowl? It's hard to see because of the glare from oh. the window. Is there a, that's better. Okay, and you can still see it. So what I did, I just put some liquid in here. And one of the things, the recipe I sent you guys, which you have, I just want to say one thing about recipes. Recipes are, they have to be in a certain way, very exact, like in proportions, but what you use can change the recipe. And it's not only, it's not bad, like one's good, one's bad. It's just different. So in my case, I'm using all butter, even though the recipe has some shortening. At the bakery, we always used a commercial shortening, uh, a non-hydrogenated shortening, because shortening has more water than butter. and it is more elastic. And so it gives your bread a kind of a stretchy, elastic texture that helps give it that cake-like, not bread-like feeling. And so that's why, you know, a lot of recipes call for both. The other thing that's in there for you, you can either use liquid milk, and then you would, instead of using the water, the water level would be the 
the liquid milk, or you can use the powdered milk. Again, in, at the bakery, it's less expensive, and there's a high-tech dry milk that we buy that bakers use that's especially designed to be baked in into bread. And so um, for us, it works a lot better. We don't have to worry about the milk spoiling or having enough. And it's a little less expensive too, but it really comes out good. So in your case, like carnation dry milk works, any of those kind of dry milk things that products at stores. And that way you don't have to worry if you have a little box of it and you want to make bread once a month, you won't have to worry about having the milk. In my case today, again, I'm going to vary things. So I have some buttermilk because I want a little bit of the richness of the buttermilk in the, in the bread, because the recipe I'm using, your recipe, it's a little leaner than the one that we use at the bakery. But anyway, what I've done is I also have here, I'll move back here. This is the sugar and a little bit of salt. So you have the egg yolks. I'm using egg yolks. You can use whole eggs or egg yolks, whatever you like. The egg yolks are richer. Again, I like it better to be richer. Butter, I have a little uh, dash of sour cream. That's another thing you can add or not add if you don't want it. And I'm going to just put the dry ingredients there. Then I'm going to put the flour, which I have this, I have very nice, very, very high quality, all purpose, unbleached flour. And it's enriched, but unbromated. That's very important. Always buy unbromated flour. It's a chem chemical they use that is not as good for you as the regular flour like this. And it's not bleached, so it has a lot of nutrients in it that the bleaching process gets rid of. So I'm putting my five cups of flour in there. You see, I didn't level it off. No, because this is uh, the recipe's already me measured. Anna, if you have a question, go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah, you can stop me anytime, it's fine. No, I go ahead, have, Hannah. I don't have a big screen of him. Does everybody else have a big screen? I just have a small. You probably you have, have to go to the speaker view. The speaker view. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, Michael. Michael, look up when you're talking because all we see is the top of your head. Oh, there you go. Okay. Don't it's look at the look camera. Up. Look straight it's ahead. Hard, it's hard to look up and do what I'm doing. Yeah. You're gonna see the top of my head a little bit. No, just when you're talking. That's all I'm oh, saying. Okay. So now I've got the liquid here. I'm gonna put the cup of milk in, which could be water and the powdered milk would have been in there already. I put the yeast in. In this case, what you're gonna buy is the instant uh, dry yeast or the, uh, this one is the uh, rapid rise. It makes it grow a little faster. You only have to let it rise once. And with this bread, we generally only let it rise once anyway. So you know what, what I'm talking about when I say rising, we're, this is a fermented dough. So the yeast is gonna multiply inside there and eat the food that's in there, the sugar and the, and the, the nutrient in the flour. And as it grows and multiplies, it expands with gas, it gives off gas, and uh, it has an enzyme that, that reacts with the flour. And that's kind of uh, the chemical action that's gonna happen in the bread. So normally I have a mixer at home, I mean at the bakery, so I don't do it by hand like this, but I, I'm in Virginia at my son's house. So we're gonna have to do it the old fashioned way. And I'll show you, this will take a while so we can talk while I'm doing this. And so while you're, while you're doing that, Michael, I just want to let everyone know <laughs> that this is really great of Michael to do this. He, uh, had, he was going to Virginia this weekend. And so it's wonderful that he was still and able so to do this program from Virginia. Do this program from Virginia. So if you're going to do it by hand like I uh -huh. am. I was wondering whose kitchen you were in. Yeah, I'm in, in uh, Virginia at Roland. And yeah, in, uh, Virginia our... Uh, Son and daughter-in-law are uh, having their first baby in a few months. So we came to visit and babysit their dogs for a few days while they went to visit some of her relatives that have never met Roland with the COVID. As you can imagine, you know, meeting people has been tough. So they made this arrangement and we offered to help them. 
So they just got back this morning. So as you can see, I'm just getting all the wet stuff off my fingers. It's kind of fun when you make bread from scratch like this because you really get a feeling of the dough. Um, is I'm there just going to grab a little. Michael? Yes. Is there a blind that can be lowered yeah. in the window that's facing you? Well, not really because okay, no, no blind. And we thought this would be better. Okay. But I guess, how about now? No. Back. Hey, uh, hang, on. hang on. Can I make? How about now? Much better. Much, much better. Okay, that's what I thought. Okay, just give me one second. I have to walk away for a second. Give me one second. I have to walk away. <laughs> Again, one of the things that, you know, as a commercial baker, you know, I use the same brands of things and the same method of things day after day that we work on, you know, and so for, you know, many years. And here I had to buy the flour at a store. Um, the wetness and the, the difference in the strength of the flour, which is real technical, but you know, there's protein in flour. And as you're mixing it, what I'm doing now, you see it's like really crude, rough, it's sticky, it looks like a big mess. But that's because I haven't developed the gluten, which is the protein in the flour uh, as you work it or like in, in the case of a mixer, you know, the mixer is going around, turning the dough around. And as you do that action, you create a uh, kind of a triangular shaped girder system inside the dough that traps first the water or the liquid. Oh, that's weird. It kind of gets a delay in the sound. <laughs> Does this mean you cannot make gluten-free challah? Well, no, I'm not saying that. There are recipes. The, the problem with the gluten-free products, uh, to be honest, they don't have the strength that gluten has. And even though they try to substitute other things to help with that, you can never get a, a tall you know, loaf of bread that's not gooey inside because there's not enough strength to... to capture the liquid. <clears throat> so in my opinion, the best gluten-free breads that I've eaten are all uh, low flat breads. So you're not gonna be able to braid it into a beautiful loaf. But I'm not saying that you can't. But will it still taste good? I have no idea because I'm a Will glutton. it taste good? I'm a glutton for gluten. So I don't really <laughs> work with gluten-free. I tell people, if you want that, Go to somebody that likes it or wants it because i don't believe that it's possible personally michael we have a question when sure. recipes use milk can you substitute non-dairy like oak oat milk uh, or is yeah, the dairy protein can. helpful any liquid any liquid is fine the the difference is some of the inside of milk is fat there's a little bit of fat and that turns into color inside the dough and so if you're using some other liquid like water or oat or whatever it is, I, you'd have to experiment to see, do you get the, uh, the color of the bread and the texture of the bread that you want? It's an experiment, but you can use water. I mean, if you're poor and you don't, can't afford milk, you, know, you can easily just use water. It won't come out the same, but it won't be bad. Like I started out saying, there's nothing bad. As long as you develop the dough, um, properly, you know, you'll just get different effects. Like all the ingredients, sugar, salt, they all give color to dough and they balance the taste. Like if you ever had a bread that was missing the salt, you'd know it right away. Like somebody forgot to put the salt in. It just has a funny, it's missing something taste. So now that I've got it developed a little bit here, you can see, can everybody see that? It's starting to get nicer, look more like a dough. So now it's gonna take me a couple of minutes here of kneading it, which is a lot of work. Oh good, the sun went behind the clouds. That yes. Help. So now this is called kneading. So this is the action I was talking about. We're developing inside the dough by 
moving it around and pushing on it. And you can see how, how I keep working this side of the dough. And in this case, the dough is nice and a nice texture that I don't need a lot of flour. If it was wetter and sticking to the uh, table, I'd have to dust it with flour. And if it was too dry, I'd have to add a little liquid. But right now it feels pretty good. See, I stick my fingers in it and, and my fingers come out with a little dough on it. That means it's a nice texture. But now it takes several minutes of this mixing. How's the one in the oven? Good. Not coming out? In a minute, okay. Okay. So it's good. Well, I'm gonna wait till you take it out. And when it's out, then I'll we'll go and make the new one. So what we've done is to, to expedite the, the, the um, class. So this is how you mix your dough. And eventually I'm gonna show you something here. You see, I took a little piece of dough and if you take it with your fingers and mush it out with your thumbs, sometimes you take a little flour on your fingers if you need it and you kind of push it out and push it out. And as you stretch it, when the dough is ready and you've mixed it, you've kneaded it long enough, when you do this, watch how it's gonna tear. Can you see it starting to tear? So that's not ready yet because it tore before I could stretch it way out. So I have to keep kneading it for a little while. And that's a test that you can use. And what we've done is we made a dough earlier that's ready to do the next step. So that way we don't have to wait for this because it would take too long. After you knead it, you have to let it rest for like, you know, an hour. almost an hour. But I'm just showing you that it can be done by hand. And that way you don't have to go to exercise class for a couple days. And you see, I use this part of my hand, I push. I pull it over and I push, sort of like, you know, clutch and brake or gas. And see that I'm working this side of the dough and this side of the dough is staying smoother. I tell people, what you try to do is get this side to look real smooth. And it doesn't matter what's behind you here, what I can see, it's kind of messy, it doesn't matter because this is what matters. So oh, thanks. Yeah, the board's kind of sliding on me. You can take all that away. Put the dough back in this so it's gross. Okay. Okay. So here, now we're getting closer. So now you see how beautiful the dough is getting? Let's try it again. Let me get a little flour. Everybody see what I'm doing? It's getting stretchier. Now I can get it pretty far before it tears. So it's still tearing a little early, which unfortunately for my arms means it ain't ready. Is the other one out? Yes. Beautiful. Okay, so you'd keep doing this a little bit longer. It's probably about 10 minutes good 10 minutes unless you have a mixer and you get your dough like this you put it in a bowl you cover it with a towel like that and then put it in a warm place not a hot place but you know a warm place like 75 80 degree area near your oven maybe your pilot light on your gas oven or somewhere warmer and then you let it rise for about an hour and what you're going to have, here's the finished dough that rose for an hour. And you see how nice and shiny it is? This is the same dough we made before. So now my wife's going to roll it out and show you the next step. And you can even see how relaxed it is now. The other dough was tight, but now it's sat and relaxed. So the gluten rested. So now she's going to roll it out with a rolling pin, a little bit of flour, not too much. 
and you want it to be pretty long. You can see that because if you want to have some nice braids, you need some length. Right there is the soft butter. Then what we like to do, and again, this is optional, but it does make it taste better, especially if you want to make a flavored bread with cinnamon or raisins or something, you spread a little butter on the dough first. Or again, it can be margarine if it's kosher. And again, we have to, you know, we normally we have a nice spatula. We're here, and so we're using a knife. <laughs> but it works. Marcy, are you going to try this tonight? Sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah with, a, with a can of tomato soup. <laughs> that was <laughs> We had we had Monica's chicken soup for lunch. Oh my God, is it good? Monica is the queen of rolling. So then you roll up like that. I'm sure you all can do that easily. <laughs> now watch this. This is the hard part. But she's left-handed. So she's left-handed. So she puts it through, turns it and then sticks the other end through. And then you have a nice braid. Now, if you go on YouTube, there's an a Israeli woman who, who has an, a, a really cool video making so many different shapes. And you can stop it and start it. And you can really learn how to make some really interesting challah bread shapes. Um, and all you have to do is type in, you know, challah bread in, in the search, and she'll come up. It's a wonderful thing. All the women are standing around her. It's the coolest little video. Um, we made a bunch of them. Now here's, the, so she did that. Now let me show you the last thing we're gonna do. So after you braid it, before you put it in your pan, you egg wash it. I took an egg and some water and made a little egg wash. And we put the egg wash all over the top of the bread like that. And that's what gives it that beautiful glaze when it comes out of the oven. Michael, was the recipe for, was the ingredients for the egg wash in the stuff you sent? Well, at the bottom, there was a couple of different variations of glazes that people use, but one of them is just a simple egg wash. Okay. It's just an egg and you glaze it on there. So I'm not sure, I don't have it in front of me, but so then we greased the pan with a little Pam. You know, you can use anything, oil, Pam, whatever. Water, whatever. And then you put it in your pan and you let it grow until it doubles in size, just like the ingredient you know, recipe says. And you know, my trick is when the dough is ready, if you push your hand on the raw dough and your fingerprint just gently puffs back out again, you know, and it looks like you didn't touch it, then it's ready. And you can kind of even shake the pan and kind of feel that it looks you know, nice and big and fluffy. And then you put it in a 350 degree oven um, if you bake it on a sheet pan, it'll bake faster. If you bake it in a ceramic pan or like this heavy metal pan, it, uh, it'll bake a little bit slower and get more of a crust and stay in the shape. See how this is the loaf shape. If you do it in a freeform pan, it'll spread a little more. Like I make the big ceremonial breads on a big flat sheet pan and it grows like this. Oops, I'm going to get over here. It grows like, you know, like in a big dome because I put an extra bread on top. So it's like two breads together, but it does spread out a little more than this. It doesn't keep the shape. So it just depends on what you wanna do, you know? And then um, in terms of fillings, if you wanna do some of the fillings that we used to make, the more filling, the longer you have to bake it. And, you know, you might have to turn the oven down just a little bit toward the end. So you make sure that it gets fully baked inside. And how you know when your bread is ready, after you take it out of the oven, if it's too hot, put a towel over it and hold it in your hand. And when you tap it, can you hear that? It's like a hollow sound. And in your hand, you can feel the bread's light compared to when you put it in the pan when it was raw. And, and you know now it's baked. And then, you know, obviously this is a little warm, but in a minute or two, I'll cut this. So does anybody have any questions about how we did that? 
You can unmute yourself if you have questions. What do you, you stuff the hollow with? Uh, we make, okay, so at the bakery, we used to make plain raisin with white raisins, cinnamon, cinnamon raisin, cinnamon raisin with toasted walnuts, raspberry jam, chocolate and raspberry. We melt uh, this Belgian chocolate chips that we use in our cookies and spread it right on the dough and the, and the raspberry jam on the dough and braid it. And then we also, the biggest popular one for Rosh Hashanah was always the apple bread. So we make a fresh filling from sliced apples, you know, kind of tart apples, a little bit of cinnamon sugar. And then um, in your case, you won't be able to get this starch that we use, but you could just put a few, uh, like a, a tablespoon of breadcrumbs or some other uh, drying agent. Corn starch kind of works, I guess. Um, and toss the, the apples and make the filling ahead of time and see how much juice comes out of your apples. Cause some apples are wet and some apples are dry. And then if it's a little too wet, like this actual liquid, you can uh, toss a little more cornstarch or breadcrumbs. So you don't want the apples to be too wet because they'll, they, they won't bake well in the dough. And then all we do is when she rolled it out like that in that long, long piece, we spread the butter and the filling, roll it up carefully and braid it. And of course they come out a little, you know, like even this one, because this flower is not our regular flower, it tore a little bit. It could have grown a little bit longer and that wouldn't have ripped like that. It did that as it expanded in the oven in the final proofing of the oven proof, it's called. So you have the proofing while it's sitting and resting. Proofing means the fermentation process is going on. So you're getting the gas and, and the alcohol smell, which is a byproduct of fermentation, just like in beer or wine. And as that gas expands, it makes pockets, little, little air holes. And when you slice bread, that's what you're seeing in bread. That's why white bread, which has the most food, really has a lot of big air holes, like Italian bread might have big holes this big in it. Um, whereas a, 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 a heavier white bread like this with some richness in it, like from the butter and the egg yolks, is gonna be a tighter cake-like grain and you won't get such big air holes. So let's see what happens Just if we cut it slice it open. <laughs> Oh, beautiful. Nice. See? Really nice. Really nice. Look at the texture. And see, these are what I'm talking about. This kind of air hole. Bring it back a little bit, Michael. It's hard oh, to sorry. see. My these air yeah, holes perfect. are fermenting. And then this is from when we braided it, the butter kind of separated the dough a little bit. But it's got a beautiful texture. There, even there, you can see it even better. Yeah. Right. And the thin, like cru thin delicate crust. The beautiful yellow color comes from the yolks and the butter, you know, and it smells great. I wish I could send the smell to you. <laughs> yeah, it smells really uh, good. I was going to say I can smell it from here. <laughs> thank you. I wish, I wish. Uh, Michael, thank you for the scientific explanation. <laughs> I never knew how much goes into it, what's happening. Sort but of at the same time, you don't have time. to know all that. You can just... You know, I know, feel it but, and, and enjoy it for the, yeah. you know, kind of like the, uh, I don't know, it sort of has a really wonderful feeling making bread. There's nothing like making bread. You know, you feel so good afterwards. It's a little bit of work, but it's always such yeah. a great thing. Like somebody was saying, their yeah. grandmother always made homemade bread. People don't realize, you know, the little bit of time it takes, it's worth it. You know, and you could actually fit it into your schedule because one trick that I would tell you about making bread is you can mix all the stuff up the night before and put it in the fridge. And in the morning or in the afternoon when you get home from work and you have time, if you take it out while it was in the fridge, it slowed down the fermenting. And when it comes back to room temperature, you can make the loaves and bake the bread then. And that way you split the time because it sort of grew already, you know, while you were at work. And I used to do that when I, when I was uh, in college when I started baking bread because mm -hmm. I couldn't have time, you know? And, uh, and it's a really great way to do it. So um, I know I tell you, go ahead. my daughter bakes every Friday, but she goes on the, not the sweet side, except Rosh Hashanah, she does savory. So she would put an Israeli spice zatar on the top uh -huh. or, or a, you can buy at uh, Trader Joe's everything but the bagel. And these are all kind of different seeds. Yes. 
put it on top, it's mishmash. delicious. Right. Mishmash. Yes, exactly. Yeah, you can go any route you want to go. Bread is very versatile. I mean, you can make breads that do it. You could take this bread and actually use it like a brioche where you take a roast, like a pork roast or a filet of fish and you poach it. Like in the case of fish, I would poach a salmon or some other you know piece, big piece of fish, then dry it off, cool it down, roll out my dough, put the fish inside. And then there's um, different recipes for like, really you cook uh, mushrooms really slow for a really, really long time. You'd have to do this ahead of time. And you get this mushroom puree and you spread that on top of the fish, wrap it in the brioche dough with the challah bread dough, egg wash it, cut a few little holes in it so it can vent, you know, breathe and the steam can come out and you bake it in the oven and you get this golden brown crust with the fish inside. It is a great dinner and it's not hard. It sounds like, oh my God, but it's, once you do it, you'll impress your friends like you're a real chef. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome, you're welcome. So any other questions about the technique? Hi, it's great to see both of you. It's Amy. Hi. Hi. First, obviously, we're happy for you, but sad for us, um, but are grateful for all the devotion to the community that you've shown over the years. Truly, it's been beyond wonderful. So I'm glad to have this chance to thank you. Here's a question. How similar is this to a babka dough? Okay, so the, 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 the word babka, I, I love this question because I get it all the time. People will come in and say, do you have any babka? And babka actually is the word for the pan. So if you think of a decorative round pan with a hole in the middle, like, like the, the, you know, the way you make the sponge cake has the smooth pan, but this is a decorative pan with a lot of little crinkles, you know, made into the pan. And babka started with, the leftover dough that they had from all the other breads they made, like they trimmed a little bit here in their raw dough, they'd mix it all up and wrap it in a, in a pan like that. And it would grow like a cake, like, a, like a, a dome shaped like the pan, unmolded upside down. And that's what a babka is. So it's really the same dough. It's just uh, made in a different shaped pan. And people don't, don't realize because the bakery they grew up going to or their mother, or their grandmother always made a babka and called it babka, but it's actually just like it's Pascha and, and uh, uh, Easter, a white raisin bread like this is called Pascha. So we Polish. can use the dough recipe for us. If any sweet yeast raised dough works for babka, but you, need, you do need the richer dough. You're not gonna make it with like Italian bread or you know other white breads. So yeah, so that's really where the word babka comes from. It, it, it's like um, a lot of the cookies, there's kifli and, and uh, Russian tea biscuits and uh, there's a bunch of other little words that they use and all of them really are the cream cheese dough and every family or every town, you know, mm -hmm. the baker or somebody made it a little bit different shapes or sizes, but they're all really the, the same thing. And everybody, when I show it to people, oh yeah, that's kifli. And I go, no, we call it cream cheese dough. Oh, that's uh, you know, Russian tea biscuits. No, we call that cream cheese dough. So it's really funny. Yes. Um, I'm wondering what's the difference between kuchen and babka? Again, it's just a word. Okay. The only difference is the word you're using. A kuchen okay. in bread. Like I, I think of kuchen as that noodle dish that my mother makes, kuchen. She calls it kuchen. Isn't that right? That's cool. Yes. No, it's cool. Oh, yes. Okay. I'm sorry. Close. <laughs> yes. But really, all those words are just words that different parts of Europe, where people came from, that was the word they used. You know, because so many times when someone uses a particular word and I show them a loaf of this, they go, oh, that's it. You know, except it was round. Or, and then I go get the pan from the back that's round and I go, you mean the pan like this? It looked like this. Oh, yeah, that's it. So it is one of those things, um, depending on what part of the world you're from. Like there's a, there's a, a biscuit that we make in, in uh, the bakery called Pogacha. And it's like a croissant with pork and bacon laminating inside the dough, like the butter that you would do with French croissants. 
and you fold it over and you fill it, fold it over. And they also make it with potato. But in all the Slovakian countries, they make it and have different names depending on which part of, you know, that area you're from. Uh, the Czechs make it, the Hungarians make it, the Romanians make it. They all make the same dough, but they all have different words for it because they have different language. Um, so it's really interesting. Yes. What I found interesting was the way your wife braided it because I couldn't follow. She did it so fast. I couldn't follow it. The few times that I've made challah, I've used three rolls and braided it like you would Absolutely. braid somebody's hair. Um, and you can do that. I'm wondering if there is a YouTube video to show how she did it because she did well, it so the, quick. Yeah, the lady, the lady that I mentioned is an Israeli lady. If you type in challah bread on YouTube and scroll down the right hand side where there's all these videos, there's one of an Israeli lady. You can't miss it. It's kind of in the first few. And she makes 50 different ways you can make challah. Hmm. It's unbelievable. The most elaborate ways, but also that simple way. And I use what I do what you're talking about. So when I make a ceremonial bread, I get uh, three or four pounds of dough, which is way bigger than this. And I divide it into um, three big pieces and three really little pieces that are equal weight. I weigh them all out. And then the first long ones, I braid like you're talking about. So what I do is, uh, hang on, maybe I can even give you an idea. Uh, no, I don't have enough things here. So you have three, lines and this left line goes over this one this one goes over this one and you just keep going back and forth halfway down the dough then i pick it up and flip it over do the same thing then i pick it up and flip it back over and it's right side up and the whole bread is braided in three like you said and i just pinch the ends then i take the little bread and i do the same thing then i egg wash the first bread and i you know with my hands i kind of you know, fix it up a little bit so that the gaps between between the braids is equal. And then I pick up the second bread and put it on top of that egg wash bread and they grow together and you get this crown bread. And if you go to Lucy's home page on Facebook, I have lots of pictures of braided breads, raw ones, the big ones, like how I do the big ones. There's pictures of all that stuff somewhere in all the, the photos I have. Um, and there's even tables with like a hundred breads on them for the holidays. So you're right. That is, and that's a simple way to do it, but there are definitely ways you can find out on YouTube and it's great because you can stop it and start it and go back. That's what we did. We spent one day in, in January. It was so slow. We found this, somebody sent us the link to that and me and Monica sat there playing around and we made, there's a picture of us with all these different shaped breads that we made that one day. It was really fun. So um, there's no really right or wrong way. It does look really cool when you do it like she does it because she's so perfect, but she's made thousands of them. So, um, but it's basically, you know, it's a long strip. You bring around a loop, you take the long piece, you pinch the loop. So it's like a loop like this and there's a long piece still. And she takes that long piece and puts it under the loop, twists the loop and then brings the piece back through. So it's only really two moves. Hmm. Phyllis, you had a question? You can look at the, what? Go ahead. Yeah, Phyllis, you, you're Yeah, you said in the beginning to um, use unbleached flour. Um, yes. Most of the flour in the store is, is bleached. What, what is the difference and why do you say to use unbleached? Well, the, the bleaching takes out a lot of nutrients. And usually the bleached flour is also bromated, which is this chemical they add that gives bread two things, longer shelf life and bigger loaves. So commercial bakeries that, you know, want to get more dough, you know, more bread units out of the same weight of dough. They came up with this bromated scientists figured out that this bromate a chemical will expand the bread bigger. So it looks bigger. It's kind of like if you get a pint of uh, haagen and put it on the scale, the ice cream and get gallon of the cheapest white ice cream you can find, you know, like the store brand, they're going to weigh the same. One looks twice as big, it's half a gallon size, but because the 
uh, the, the expense of ice cream is so dense and it's heavier. And they're almost the same weight because the other one has air whipped into it to make it look like a half a gallon. But there's a lot of air inside there. Does that make sense? Yeah, is the, is the bleach flour, I, flour bad for you normally? Um, in it's not bad for you, but it's, but it's not as good, I guess is the right word to use. It's not like the bleaching is gonna, you know, give you cancer or something, but it, it, uh, it just makes it whiter. And again, back in the old days when Millbrook was king, people wanted white bread, really white bread. That was like, oh, we're rich, we can get white bread. Because poor people had to get brown bread. You know, I mean, all that comes from the history of food and how things developed and industries. And, uh, but, you know, unbleached flour is always better than bleached flour in quality, in my opinion. So I always go for the unbleached unbromated um i use flour from a company um that started like during the revolutionary war and uh, it's a really good flour you know commercial flour but you can't buy it in the store because they only sell like 50 pound bags do you know of a good brand that they could buy in the store well you know i mean in cleveland i guess uh, again i would be looking for any brand that says unbleached unbromated it doesn't matter the brand because if you're getting that it's going to be good and store brands like this was Wegmans, which is a store here in Virginia, and that's their store brand. It was the least expensive flour. I mean, they had gold metal and they had other ones and they were more money than this, but this is better flour than those to me. So. Okay, Hannah, you have a question? Yeah. By the way, I, I really enjoyed your, your program here. And unfortunately, I was, I was never able to get to your, to your, um, to your store and i apologize for that but it was out of my region um so i'd like to know when can i come to your house and buy a loaf of bread <laughs> you know, I wonder if they would all like to do that fortunately you know i made it i made a decision 40 years ago when i graduated from culinary school that my house was going to be my house and my business baking or cooking was going to be over there in the bakery or the restaurant and I never really wanted the idea of mixing the two. I don't blame. Uh, a lot of people nowadays have been doing it for years, but it's just not my my thing. And uh, you know, I just like to have the professional place I go, and you know, and then my home is my little hide hideaway cave. If you know what I mean? What made you decide? Uh, to get it, it, what made you decide to get into the bakery business? Well, well um, you know, I actually started in high school working in a deli. And then from the deli, I ended up as a short order cook. That was all in Cleveland. And Tell then them I went what deli. To State for Tell them what deli, oh, Michael. Sands Delicatessen. Anybody been to Sands? Which one now? Sands. Sands Delicatessen at Van Definitely, Aiken. yeah. Betty Sand. Yeah, I worked there before Chuck bought it from Mr. Sand. And then I worked for Chuck for many years. Uh, and then anyway, when I went out west, to finish, I was at Kent and then I went out west and finished my undergraduate degree in liberal arts at a school in California. And um, I was at the crossroads of, you know, where do I get a career with, an, with a liberal arts degree? Do I go to graduate school? And at that time, I had still been working in restaurants. Out there, I got in San Francisco, I got involved in some pretty fancy places, a big hotel and a couple restaurants. And I started cooking and being a server and one of the chefs at one of the restaurants said, you know, you should look at this culinary school if you're not sure you want to go to graduate school. So I went over there, fell in love with the idea and enrolled in the uh, California Culinary Academy, which was a executive chef's degree program in a very high end small school um, right in San Francisco. And um, my first uh, kitchen was the baking kitchen. And my first professor turned out to be one of my good friends and um, over the years, we became good friends. And how it started was I worked in this um, old restaurant that had a brick oven. And he wanted to test out baking breads in a brick oven. And he didn't have one. And when he found out you know, from you know, our introductions at the beginning of the class that I had worked at that restaurant, he asked me what I asked them. Could we go over there and do some bread baking? So I got him in there to do the bread baking. And we became close friends. And he got me into an apprenticeship at a very large factory bakery. And that was really what started it. Then I 
fell in love with it. I love the guys. I was working with all these European guys. And one thing led to another. When I graduated, I went into a culinary program at a, a fancy restaurant. I didn't like it. And I answered an ad for a bakery and started there in 1980. And I've been baking ever since. So, and when I moved back to Cleveland, I started Sweet Surrender. And it was really funny because growing up, I knew about Buckeye because as kids, we used to ride our bikes to Shaker Square, and, you know, kids at Shaker rode everywhere. And so I knew about Lucy's and all the little bakeries and places where we could buy candy and stuff like that. So I kind of, in my mind, thought about that as I went, got, went to graduate, that, you know, it would be great to own that kind of an old fashioned bakery where you live above the bakery kind of thing. And I didn't think there was anything left in Cleveland like that because I really wasn't aware of really outside of the east side when I left, you know, we were all insulated, you know, we didn't really go anywhere else. So when I got back and I started exploring Cleveland, I realized, hey, there's a lot of more to Cleveland than just Shaker Heights. Um, I answered a realtor's ad and it was for Lucy's and I merged my company and her company and that was in 1994. And fast forward, it's 27 years now. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? All right. Well, Michael and Monica, I want to thank you very much. This has been interesting, educational, fun. I think everybody can try this. It looks pretty easy. Even I could do this. And if I could do this, anybody could do it. I try, I try to make it so that, you know, you feel like you have confidence to try it. And again, you know, nowadays, Days. there's so many recipes online and videos you know if you spend a little time doing a little research on your own you'll you, you'll kind of zone in on what feels good for you and who speaks to you and then you can just follow them. um i do have one more question that just came up sure is there anyone else in the region or country who is doing the quality of hungarian european baking that you did Honestly, I don't know. I can't believe there isn't because there are a lot of chefs all over the country. And even in Cleveland, there are places that do pretty good stuff. But it's, but everybody's a little different. I mean, even like the regular breads I make, I make about 12 or 14 kinds of you know grainy breads like wheat bread. If I gave 10 trained bakers, you know, the same bowls of ingredients to make a whole wheat bread, I'd come out with 10 slightly different whole wheat breads because each one has their own style and technique and way they do things. So it's, it, it is really hard. Um, I inherited the recipe from Lucy. It was kind of like the same recipe I knew. And over the years, we've tweaked it a little bit and done little things about how we bake them or um, how, how long we let the dough rise. Um, Cause we make big batches, like 50 pound batches, not one little loaf. So it changes the dynamic a little bit. But honestly, I, I don't know. Nobody makes challah bread like we did. That's the <laughs> answer. <laughs> Straight from the baker's mouth. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, and, and honestly, we're looking for young people. You all know people. It, you know, if we could find a couple of people that want to build a new place somewhere and incorporate what we did. I would be more than happy to, you know, share in a business arrangement, how we make things, what we do. I have my whole thing. I have my website, my, you know, social media, my recipes, techniques, you know, contacts, you know, reputation and all that can be plugged into a place um, with a longer term window of opportunity than the space we were in. Just we just lost the chance to do it there. So um, I'd be more than happy to still do that. But somebody has to step up to the plate and take the, you know, the initiative to have a business plan and the money and the, you know, the things that I did to make it. I mean, you know, it doesn't happen just because you want it to happen. You have to do the work. And, and I think that's one of the, you know, sad, you know, ways things are today. People don't want to do the work. They just want to be at the top. You know, I mean, it's a cliche, but it seems like it's, you know, true because it's hard to find people. I've been spending 10 years looking. This didn't just happen like yesterday, this whole problem. When I moved there 10 years ago, almost 11 now, I started this process of looking. 
and here we are. Well, it's sad, and it's true not only with bakeries. Uh, the Chinese restaurant near me, he closed because he couldn't find anybody to take over, but, you know, cooking. And mm -hmm. I think it's true for lots of places. What you said is right. It's hard to find people that really want to put in the work. So, well, again, I want to thank you. You have to love what you do. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, Michael. Thank you, Marika. Thank you, Roly, for being the tech guy. And Glad it we appreciate out. it. And again, if you want to donate to Naamat uh, in honor of Michael and Marika and Lucy's, we would appreciate it. And I hope you all try and bake some bread and send me photos of you baking the bread. I'd love to see the photos and would share them with our with our friends that are on our e-blast and with our national folks. And we'd love to see that. So good luck, everybody. Thank you. And this is being recorded. I will send the recording to everyone once I get it. It's on, it's going on the cloud and, um, but I will send that to you. So